welcome back to the well with shan and i am so excited to have my good friend and my brother tori worley with us today and uh, this is actually going to be one of our first podcasts so i'm excited about it um tori has been at um the hope for the inner city for the last six years he is a native of clarksville tennessee and uh, above and beyond all that good stuff with community development, he is my dear friend. We've had some dance parties together. We have had lots of good food feasts together. Tori likes to eat. Mm -hmm. I like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy it. And her husband can cook. And my husband can cook. She can, make, she can make some mean desserts. My <laughs> husband. <laughs> you got the savory part. Yeah, he's got the good, the goods down. So we we play games. My kids love you. You you're just a, a a good blessing. You have definitely some good relationship gifts, I think. And um, so Tori, I have asked you here so that we could just begin to talk about your story. And uh, you said your request was you wanted to entitle this God's hand so just begin to tell me a little bit about yourself and your story and how you have seen God's hand at work in your life well um when I think about my life it's it's evident that God has a plan uh for me for my family for the people around me and so that's why I was thinking God's hand because it's all his his hand his story um but just thinking even going back to, uh, I'll just start with my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother was born in Hungary, and after World War II, her family was sent to Germany. Hmm. Uh, my grandfather was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and in the Army, he was stationed in Germany. So uh, the way they met was she was walking somewhere, and he saw her and asked if he could walk with her the rest of the way. And they got to know each other from there. And so if that's not God's hand bringing two people together, <laughs> Who you talk about being different? Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah. Yes. There's nothing else um, but his hand. So um, that's my mother's family, and uh, she's the oldest of that union. Um, and then there are three others after that in that union. And so um, just looking at how we've spread out, how we've connected with others in our family, um, having Filipino aunties, and, uh, Canadian cousins, and German cousins, and. Um, God has just made it very evident that he's uh, working on something. So, mm. uh, I just don't have to go any further than my family to see that. That's so cool. Mm. And you've got that international flair there. You've got a little something different there that most of us don't have. Yeah. Um, it showed up in how I eat. <laughs> uh, I grew up eating a lot of German food, um, schnitzel and bratwurst and German potato salad and Labor case and uh, roll out and all that stuff, just this stuff. And then I met my dad's family in North Carolina, who were just black country people, mm. and I didn't know how to eat their food. Uh, I didn't know how to eat neck bones and collard greens and cornbread. I didn't. That wasn't me. <laughs> so I'm the blackest countryest looking person, but my whole upbringing was just European because my grandmother was. She held a lot of sway over my upbringing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. So you yeah. never know a book by its cover. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't make assumptions. No, that's God's hand. <laughs> All right. So you grew up in Clarksville, and I have heard you say before that you, you know even with your international influence, you did grow up in Section Eight housing. Mm -hmm. So so tell us about that piece of your story and how you got there. Uh, so my mother was 19 when she had my brother, who's older than me. Um, 19, yeah, 19. And I guess she lived with my grandmother for a little bit after that. But right before I was born, they moved into an apartment complex in Clarksville. Um, if you don't know about Clarksville, it's uh, the fifth biggest city in Ch in, in Tennessee. Um, and the presence of an army base there is kind of what made the population grow. Um, that's how my grandfather got there. That's how my dad got there, was through that army base. And so the apartment complex was right across the street from the army base. Um, and so I was born uh, and went 
right to that apartment complex. And we didn't move till I was 14. So my whole adolescent being shaped was in that community. Um, and yes, section eight, lots of single mothers. Um, for a time, like when the, the crack epidemic was pretty strong, it was prevalent around. I didn't see a lot of it, but I saw the effects of it um, in people's lives. Um, then there was gangs when me and my brother got a little older. So my brother was in a gang. Um, my mom worked at the little gas station up the street from our apartment complex. Um, and then there was lots of people in and out because you had the army base. You had just being poor, you know, people are transient quite often. And so um, there were just lots of people in and out of our apartment complex. Uh, but there was still a, like a stable core of people who I grew up with and who I still maintain relationships with today. Um, and that's, like I said, that just shaped me. Um, and especially um, when churches reach out to those kind of communities, uh, that's kind of where my story changes too, is uh, a local church sent a missionary into our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, an older white lady. She might have been in her 40s, but she seemed old to me. Uh, well, I was like six. She was old to me. <laughs> uh, she had two kids, and they would come in her beat-up station wagon, and they would do Bible clubs with us, uh, take us into the laundromat, and just share the story of Jesus with us. In the laundromat. In the laundromat, yeah. She said all the kids in there from the neighborhood, and she would open a big storybook Bible and tell us the story of Jesus. She would play games with us. She'd do crafts with us. Um, she would tell us about missionaries going to other countries and sharing the gospel. And so that really um, grabbed my heart mm. hearing that. And before, I guess before she was done with her time with us, she said, if anybody wants to pray to receive Jesus, then pray with me. And so I prayed. I didn't tell her that I did, but I was sitting in the back, you know, and I prayed. And How old I, were you? I can never remember, but I feel like I was six, somewhere, wow, young, young, really young, really young. Mm. So um, that that's where my story changes. There was other Christian influences. Church buses came through our neighborhood all the time. There were Christians who lived in our neighborhood who would take us to church. And, um, so when I talk about God's hand, I didn't plan any of that. God had a presence in, in our lives, in our community all the time. And so the work I do now, um, bringing missionary groups to Chattanooga, I tell them all the time, like, God is already here. Don't think you're just bringing God to the community. Mm -hmm. he's, he's already at work in ways you don't even know. Mm. Um, and so I, I get that from my own my own upbringing and seeing it happen. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, because uh, sometimes we can have that mentality that we're we're somehow bringing God to the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, which nothing is. <laughs> then we run into him like, oh, you've been here for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Jesus is already here, and he's already at work. I love that. So, obviously, there are some unique strengths and weaknesses, um, ways that we get wounded, and ways that inspire us on in, in any neighborhood that, that we're in. Can you maybe name some of the ways that you think you were in that shaping that you're talking about ways that you were maybe were wounded and then also uh ways that you might have been inspired hmm. um a, a huge wound of mine was uh, my relationship with my dad um and it, he was there for a little bit, then he left, and he would call me and tell me he was, he was going to send me a bike or give me a bike for my birthday, and it never came. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, dealt a blow to my trust of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and also his absence made it very easy for me to believe that God was absent, I think. Um, because at a certain age, 12 or something, before we moved out of that complex, I had determined to become an atheist. Um, and it was really easy for me to push God away because there was no presence in my home saying God is present. You know, so um, so that, that, that was a major wound. Um, but I have to make it clear to people that uh, I never went through life like blaming my dad or angry with my dad um, about that. And that's the God's honest truth. It was just a fact that he was absent. Mm -hmm. And he didn't keep his word. <laughs> um, but I have to.
to say also that our relationship has been restored um, over the years, and he's one of my favorite people to talk on the phone to. Nobody can make me laugh like my dad. Wow. Um, and so, again, man, God's hand, he's just dealing in that relationship as well. Um, another major wound in that community uh, was my sexual um, just brokenness, being being fed and being exposed. Um, there was lots of just sexual activity around me all the time when I was young. I think those are the two biggest wounds I can think of in that community. Um, how, so how do you feel like the Lord has brought you through those two? Because those are two major yeah, wounds. Yeah, yeah. And yet here you are, You, as far as I know, not that you're perfect or have been completely flawless, but you're walking with the Lord, you're in church, you, you're in a ministry. How have you seen the Lord bring you through those two things? I think it's the things that inspired me from that community. Um, neighborly love was mm. huge in our neighborhood. Um, if somebody needed something and you had it, you gave it. If you needed something, you asked. Um, if, if somebody went somewhere, they took you with them. <laughs> like, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, and we just rose and fell as a community a lot of times. Uh, we had neighbors that had hard things going on, domestic abuse, child abuse, and we dealt with it together. Yeah. Um, seeing our mothers, uh, just one simple thing, but I always like to remember my our mothers cleaning the breezeway. They would pour bleach water out in the breezeway and they would all sweep together. Um, and I just thought, you know, looking back on that, that was really a blessing to see people caring for their community. Mm. Um, and that's another reason I tell groups that we bring in, like, don't judge this community. <laughs> you don't know what these people go through together. Um, it looks tough, but you don't. You just don't know what the day-to-day -day is like. And so um, I know people probably came into our neighborhood and was like, these poor single mothers, you know, welfare queens, whatever they wanted to call them. They just didn't know the day-to-day. -day. These were hardworking women. Um, and they took care of each other and their kids, each other's kids. So we all shared moms. My friend's mom was my mom. I had a friend whose mom couldn't speak English. Um, they were from the Dominican Republic, but she was our mom. <laughs> she would cook for us. We ate food. We sit in the house and hang out. Uh, and my mom was his mom. He, he still, he still refers to her that way. So, um, those are the things that inspired me, helped me get through and kind of just how I live today. I love living in community. Um, I'm not so, I don't easily open up to people that way community-wise. Um, people have to kind of pull that out of me sometimes. Uh, but living close to people, spending life together, doing life together is a joy mm. because of my upbringing. So beautiful. I love that. And I know, I remember a couple of years ago, I asked you, Tori, if money weren't an issue and you could live anywhere you want to live, where would it be? And what'd you tell me? If I told you, right where I'm living? That's what you said. Right, I wouldn't be anywhere else except right there in the middle of it. Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this changed a little bit because uh, some people have moved. Um, but if I think about maybe having to leave or something, it's, it's still hard uh, because I just love, I love that community. Mm -hmm. And that's your tears. Yeah. The love, <laughs> the love for it. Yeah, and the, the thought of them just, it changing heavily. I hate change. And that's something I told my mom recently. Like, I was playing with her, but I said, you curse me with stability. Because when things change, I can't handle it. <laughs> my mom kept me in the same place for the first 14 years of my life. She didn't have men in and out the house. She, she tried to keep work, you know, make sure we had what we needed. Our family stepped in. My life was just really stable. Even in Section 8 and tough neighborhood, my life was very stable. And so when things change, it's just... It rocks me really mm -hmm. hard. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, two two edges of a sword, though, because she gave you that stability, and that that clearly comes out of you that you are a, a stable, grounded young man. <laughs> you may not feel that way, but I think you are more than you know. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about some of the beauties of the neighborhood. Um, 
but let's talk a little bit about poverty, a little bit about um, crime, a little bit about trauma, because mm -hmm. those are also things, uh, a lack of resources sometimes, although it can surprise you that there's more resources there than you think, yes, right? Yes, I'm learning um, that in Chattanooga. Yeah. Chattanooga's resource rich. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about about that that contrast. Um, we have to start with sin, because when we talk about poverty, sin is very present, um, both in people withholding resources that they could offer, and people just following their sinful nature and sometimes bringing on themselves. Mm -hmm things that um, lead them to poverty. So um, I was talking with a lady yesterday. She's very, uh, she's one of my heroes. Her name is Shay Bathia and she works for Chalmers Center. You know Miss Shay? You know Shay? Okay. Oh yeah, you know We just went yeah. through that oh, class we together. Through. Man, I was like, you know her too? I forgot. I feel like I just know her. I just know Shay. But no, she, she just, stopped. Just to clarify, we just went through a class today yeah. and Shay was our She was a leader. She was leader. leader of our <laughs> um, But yeah, she was at Hope yesterday and um, she just talked about dealing with the inner man. Mm. We have to deal with the inner man. So before we talk about what neighborhoods are looking like, what governments do, the inner man of the rich white man has to be dealt with and the poor black man has to be dealt with. Not to use those two because that's our struggle, mainly in America. Um, but everyone's inner man has to be dealt with. So, um, but the way it plays out uh, and the way I see it in my community, um, Chattanooga has a long historical um, just relationship with segregation and with all the ills that America has perpetuated on communities of color, just redlining and um, busing, and just moving out, white flight, all of that. Um, and so I see that very clearly in Chattanooga. You have the mountains where the money is, um, and people in the valley, usually where the poor people are, but it's changing, it's changing. Um, and I have to say, uh, getting to know people on the mountains, I cannot uh, paint them with a broad brush. There are people on the mountains who care for the people in the valley and uh, are being influential on their communities that don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see that. Um, uh, so um, it's, it, it just gives me hope in one sense for the issues we deal with. But um, also looking at my community, um, I see definitely spiritual warfare, people battling um, their trauma and finding ways to cope that are dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so starting to see meth come up in our community, mm -hmm. um, violence, uh, lots of shootings. Sometimes we have rashes of shootings in our neighborhood. Um, and when I first moved here, I thought shootings were about like territory or money or but it usually comes down to a girl between two guys. <laughs> a lot of times that's the story. Is there was some girl that these two guys were dealing with and something went bad and so now the two guys are at each other. Mm. Um, and I think that speaks to the deeper desire of love. Yes. People wanting to be loved, to be wanted, to be desired. Mm. Um, and if I'm not your only, then nobody else is going to be. So they got to go. Um, and so I think um, all these things need to be dealt with with the gospel with, and that's what I have to deal with in my life when I'm lonely when I'm sad when I'm scared I have to bring the gospel to my own heart mm. um, the good news that Jesus is alive and that he can meet me in my needs so mm. um, but getting people to that point sometimes is a process uh, so that's what we see as well man you gotta build relationships people have to trust you I talked to a lady the other day. She currently lives in a motel. They were put out of their apartment. Um, but when she was living in the apartment, a, a white girl moved in and was a missionary to that neighborhood. And she, this lady did not trust that white girl. She's like, she's a police, she child protective services. 
But this lady said that white girl taught me how to trust people mm. because she did what she said she would do. She loved my kids. And so now her that lady's kids are this white girl's godchildren. Wow. Um, and just seeing that, that has built a bridge for the gospel to travel across. Mm -hmm. um, That's some real life on the ground redemption yeah. happening right there. Yeah, somebody's trust. And if I'm, if memory serves me correctly, this lady that lives in the motel, uh, talk about trauma. I believe her grandmother was killed in a drive-by shooting, like just sitting on the porch. There was a drive-by targeted somewhere else, but she was, and you talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are carrying layers of trauma um, in our community um, from years of struggle yes. um, and generations. It's just, it can be overwhelming to think about sometimes. So it's given me a heart to be more patient and not expect mm -hmm. middle class fruit, <laughs> mm -hmm. middle class values when people are so heavy with burdens. Now, you're, you're kind of speaking all around that, but it's hard to work in trauma places, it, you know. It, it's hard to be the recipient of trauma. It's it's hard to keep working and 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 being patient and and staying, you know, in those places. What what keeps you going? You you mentioned a lot of things, but what what keeps you um, through the burnout, through the the rigors of it all to to stay in there? Um, I would like to point to one thing, but there's not just one thing that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. um, a huge thing I come back to is the gospel. And that's just knowing Jesus is alive and that there's still hope. Um, so I work for an organization called Hope. And we have a big banner in our hallway that says hope on it. And so every time I walk past that, I just remind myself that hope is for me too. Mm, that, not just for those people. Yeah, not just, no, nah, man, I need it more than them. <laughs> I yes. need it more than them. Yes, me too. Uh, so, uh, just remembering that Jesus is still alive. There's still breath in my body. And that's become part of my ministry. When people say, Tori, is it hopeless? Is there, is there anything? I got a kid that asks me all the time because he's in and out of jail. Um, is there hope for my relationship with my daughter? And I tell him, man, as long as Jesus is alive and there's breath in your body, there's hope. So, um, God has put a special place in your daughter's heart for you. Mm -hmm. And so you need to do right by it, but there's hope. And so that's the biggest thing that keeps me going mm -hmm. is just reminding myself that Jesus is alive mm -hmm. and I'm breathing. So there's hope. Mm -hmm. Um, other things, definitely community, definitely people checking in on me. Uh, definitely people calling me out on my hypocrisy my sin or just recognizing me I had a brother tell me yesterday like man the things you're telling me about what's going on in your life makes it sound like you're being attacked and so uh, just wanted to share that with you let you know I'm praying for you that lifted my heart <laughs> that's a hard thing to hear but to know somebody recognizing where I'm at and they see you yeah mm -hmm. I'm being seen helps me to okay I can go on um but back to God's hand, I, I believe I was shaped <laughs> for what I do through my upbringing. Just mm -hmm. the, the uh, I don't know what you call it, the maze of poverty and trauma and all of that is what I witnessed, what I was shaped by. Um, so it's not foreign to me and so repulsive to me that I feel like I can't be here. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear my neighbor screaming at their kids. This is what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people that would call the child protective service right away, but mm -hmm. I, I remember my mom getting my brother together and it took some raising of the voice before. So I'm not repulsed by that. I'm not traumatized by that, but I'm just understanding some of the, the nuance of life in such a community can helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, what is it that you would want middle class America to know about your neighborhood? Uh, t 
two things. <laughs> There's a lot of beauty. And sometimes I don't want them to know about my neighborhood. I don't want them to know that it exists. Mm. Because they're going to want to move there. Uh, gentrification being what it is. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, sometimes like, look, don't even come to this part of town and know that it's so convenient to downtown. And, uh, we have all these amenities, you know. Just just pass it by, keep going, keep thinking it's nothing. Enjoy it. But um, I know those maybe sound contradictory, but uh, when those groups come in, when I bring missionary groups in, I make sure I highlight the beauty that's in our community. Um, because I hear some of the beliefs that people have about our neighborhood. And like I said, um, welfare queens, no dads, you know, gangs are just rampant. And, and that is true to an extent, but I've seen more fathers involved in their children's lives in Chattanooga than I've seen when I was growing up. Yeah. There's just a lot of beauty in our neighborhood. There's a great fabric in Chattanooga. Um, the history that people have had together, uh, the traditions they have, frozens and fish fries. And, yeah, you know about frozen. Yeah. Yeah. All of that. It's just, man, it just makes the, the community very beautiful to me. Mm. So even in the hard time, the, the things that aren't beautiful, there's still a beauty there. Mm -hmm. so. I love seeing it through your eyes and appreciate you sharing all of that. Um, Folks, if, if you don't know him yet, get to know him. Tori Worley, my brother, thank you for being with us. And I just want to say your chance for the day. This is our father's world. What part of this world have you yet to get to see and get to know? Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks for letting me.